Hi everyone and welcome to another live stream. Today we're going to be talking about Mesh Machine and Decal Machine, both of which are super cool, so I'm definitely excited to get started in this. Um, yeah, hi, and I like looking through the chat earlier, check out what everybody's up to. Uh, thanks for coming, this should be a lot of fun. So last week we talked about uh, specifically box cutter and hard ops. And that was cool because we had Jerry on to talk about his own add-ons and both of those were really neat. But one of the big complaints or I guess issues that I had with the workflow of hard ops and box cutter is that it tends to be very destructive. Uh, when you cut into meshes using booleans and whatnot, uh, you tend to add, end up with like a lot of weird geometry and in the case of beveling after those, it ends up being very destructive because you can't really work with bevels after they're completed. Well, this first add-on that we're going to be talking about, Mesh Machine, is pretty specifically made for that, and it makes that workflow something that's actually non-destructive. So, whereas hard ops um, basically automated a lot of processes that were already available to you in Blender, it just made them much faster, Mesh Machine actually does some new stuff that you couldn't really do before at all. And so that makes it a little bit magic. So before we get started, I have a little presentation here. just to talk about the add-ons and kind of give you a heads up of where we're going. So first off, these are made by Machine. You can follow him on Twitter or on ArtStation. Um, and I reached out to him and asked him if he wanted to come on the stream, him or her, we don't know. Uh, but they said that they'd rather not. They wanted to remain an enigma for the time being. So I can definitely respect that. But they make some super cool artwork. Um, here's a few examples of, of their stuff, and you can tell they obviously know exactly what they're doing. I mean, this is just gorgeous modeling. And what's even cooler about this is, unlike some of the uh, hard ops renders and stuff that you'll see that also looks similarly awesome, this is low poly stuff. This is stuff that you can put in a video game and actually use in a game creation pipeline. It's not super high poly. So it's pretty awesome. So they definitely know what they're doing, and these add-ons kind of help them go through that process a bit quicker. So first up, we're going to be talking about Mesh Machine, and this is what makes the bevel modeling workflow much less destructive. Um, I won't say it makes it completely destructive, or completely non-destructive, uh, because there are still a few edge cases where you can kind of get yourself into trouble. But for the most part, it makes beveling something that's actually non-destructive and really easy to undo at any point. So Mesh Machine, he calls it the missing essentials, and I would totally agree with that. After using this quite a bit um, and kind of trying to dig into exactly what's going on, this is stuff that I feel like really should have been in Blender for a while, um, and I haven't really seen in other programs either. Maybe they are and I just haven't found them. Uh, but yeah, this is stuff that makes modeling so much easier and uh, more efficient. So what exactly are these different tools? Well, here's an overview and I'll demo each of these as we go. Uh, but just to list them out, first of all, it can turn chamfers into bevels and back. It can unbevel and unchamfer to go back to a hard edge. It can change the width of a chamfer or bevel, change the segments of an existing bevel, resolve some tricky geometry overlaps where two bevels meet, Flatten polygons based on another polygon or three vertices. Flatten along a normal or flatten along edges. Turn chamfer corners. Convert triangular bevel corners into quad corners. And a few other things. So that's kind of a long list to go through and it's kind of hard to picture in your head. So let's go ahead and take a look at exactly what all of that is. So here I am in Blender. And to get to the Mesh Machine menu, first you just need to be in Edit Mode. And then you press Y and that'll bring up all of these different options. And there's not really that many. Uh, there's just a few, and but they are quite powerful. So the first one that's probably the most important is turn chamfers into bevels and back. And this one is, is just really cool. So, but in order to show that, you kind of have to need to know what's the difference between a bevel and a chamfer. And it's very much a technical detail, uh, mostly used in other software. I know 3ds Max calls 
bevels chamfers and blender calls everything bevels and it's it can get a little weird but it's like a technical like wood cutting term or at least it's from there um and the difference is if i just duplicate this if you select an edge hit Control b and you just have that you know there's no edge loops in between it's just that one flat edge that would be a chamfer and if you hit Control b scroll up now you're making a bevel so not a massive difference between the two but in terms of usability and how you work with them they can be a bit different so in case you're wondering that's the difference between a bevel and a chamfer and as you're going definitely let me know in the chat if there's any questions um, yeah, so the first thing is you can turn chamfers into bevels and back, and this is just way too much fun. I could spend a lot of time doing this, but let's say you have a chamfer like this, and you hit Y, you can then hit Fuse, which is going to turn a chamfer into a bevel, and then you'll get these options down here to change the number of segments. You can change the tension to make it either flatter or more pointy, whatever you want to do, and you can also change the width. So that's kind of nice. But what's also interesting is that you can then take something like this and then just turn it back into a chamfer. So if we select this, hit Y, and then go, um, let's see, unfuse, because we fused it first, that's going to turn it right back into a chamfer. So that is definitely magic. And you can see this if we do this a lot. So with just that one example, if you wanted to turn this back into the chamfer, you could probably just select all of these guys and it's like dissolve edge loops or something let's delete edge loops like that and so we can get back to it that way but that's not that hard um, but if we have a lot of bevels say we bevel this we bevel this side then it's much more difficult to actually go back and do that because we don't have those supporting edges that we can kind of snap back to so it would take quite a lot of work and frankly it's not even worth it. So at this point, if I was modeling regularly, I would just kind of have to commit to this and go for it. Like there's not really any going back from this point. And that's what kind of frustrated me about the kind of the hard ops workflow. Um, but now you can just hit Y, unfuse, and there you go. So it makes it very, very simple. Now you can also unbevel, which is similar, except it'll bring it straight back to a hard edge. So if you select these guys and the quick way of doing that um, that I love to use is just select one face, hold control, select the last one, it'll select the shortest path between the two, and then you can just hit Y, and then I'll go unbevel, it'll bring that right back to a hard edge. So I can actually bring this all the way back to just a normal cube by selecting these, and it'll automatically do it for all of the edge loops uh, for these faces, so I only need to select those, hit Y, and unbevel. I'll do the same over here. Hit Y, unbevel, and we're back to our cube. And what's really cool is that these are still exactly uh, where they were before. A lot of the other ways of doing this would kind of like tilt the face a little bit, or maybe it won't be exactly, uh, maybe it'll be shifted one way or the other, uh, but this is actually going to bring it back to exactly a cube, uh, which is really, really cool. Yeah, Omar, it's, it's ex extremely useful. Um, yeah, so I mean, just that alone is probably useful enough by itself, but there's actually a lot more that it can do. Um, so let's see, what's next? We can change the width of an existing chamfer or bevel. So let's say, well, actually another thing that's, that's kind of cool is that he gives you a tutorial.blend that's like right in the menu. So let's open this up. And this is kind of just a fun little playground for playing with all these different options. And they give uh, really good examples of, of what's what. Let me make this a little bit brighter. There we go. So yeah, we can play around with some of these. Let's go with this one. So if we tab into edit mode, Give this guy some bevels. Hit Y, fuse that up. Select, uh, let's see, maybe this top face. Bevel that. 
select this whole area. We can bevel that. We can also fuse it like so. So if we wanted to normally, I mean, if we wanted to change the width of this, good luck. Like, I don't think you really could. So now, if you just hit Y, you can hit Refuse, and that's going to select all of that, and you're, gonna, you're going to have more options in this little F6 menu. Uh, we can now change the number of segments here. We can adjust the tension, and we can also adjust the width. Now it gets a little bit weird if you're uh, doing some different stuff. You can see that this vertex right here isn't exactly going in the right way, um, but it's still a work in progress. But overall, the fact that this is even possible is very, very nice, and it still keeps this face flat and this face flat, which is the most important part. Let's see. Yeah, basically everybody so far is saying that it looks awesome, and it is indeed awesome. Um, Omar has a question, does that functionality work seamlessly with hard ops and box cutter, or do they cancel each other and all hell breaks loose? No, they do work very well together. In fact, uh, they work so well together that Jerry actually put this into the hard ops menu. So if you have Mesh Machine and you're using hard ops, you can hit Q, go to Operations, and find all of the Mesh Machine stuff right in here. Um, so he used it so much that he put it into his own menu. So it's definitely works very well together, and I'd say a perfect complement. Yeah, but that's not all. Uh, let's see, what's next? So after you can already uh, change the width and segments and stuff after you've already made a bevel, you can also resolve some tricky geometry. So I don't know if I've made any tricky, tricky geometry yet. Let's see if I can mess stuff up a little bit. Maybe selecting these guys. It's really easy to make a mess when I'm not trying to, but I'm not sure exactly how to do this when I am trying to. Hmm. I'll have to find a good, a good use case as we go. Maybe we'll run into one. Uh, but this next tool is really helpful if you have some of these like crossed in areas where occasionally you'll get something that looks kind of like this, uh, where things are kind of bent in the wrong direction, where you just kind of like overshoot the bevel a little bit and it'll, it'll just get messed up. Uh, so what you can do is select these vertices. You'll need at least four selected in that edge loop and hit Y and you can use the unf tool. And I'll call it the unf tool because the uh, star means like multiplication. So I think you're supposed to multiply the F sound as you say it to uh, keep that family friendly. But yeah, so hit Y, go unf and there we go. It's back to normal. So if you have any of those areas where things get kind of like tangled up and like flipped around, then hit Y, unf, and there you go. So that just makes fixing that very simple. Uh, and there's a few different options as well. You, uh, let me do that again. You can change the width and uh, change the tension and all that stuff just to make sure that you're getting it back to the right spot. So that definitely comes in handy quite a bit. What's after that? Oh yeah, so you can also flatten polygons, which is a good one. Uh, he provides a good example over here. Let's see, with the flatten along edge. So with this first one, we can flatten along the face. So if we hit Y and see flatten with these two faces selected. So one of them is the active face and that's what the selection is going to be flattened according to. So if you select this face and then select that one, hit Y and then flatten. It's just going to flatten that uh, along these edges here. And you can also see that there's options for along normal or along edge, in this case, along edge. Um, and that's really nice because if you've ever used the 
uh, loop tools flatten, which I used a couple times in the modeling weapons for a first person shooter course. Um, I really love the flatten tool and it's, it's super handy. But if you try to do that with something like this, you go W loop tools flatten, you would get pretty much garbage. And one of the big problems with this is it distorts your, your edges. Like these are no longer flat. They're kind of bulged out. This came up, that one came up and it's a total mess. Um, but with this, it's a different type of flatten. And so everything else is kept nice and straight. You're not messing up this face. You're not messing up that face. Uh, you're just kind of sliding these vertices along until that face becomes flat with those other edges. <laughs> Matthew says, hilarious and functional. That's good. That's good. I like that. Um, similarly with this one, we can do the same thing with uh, edges. I believe we select these two edges and it'll flatten this whole face according to these edges. So it knows to flatten this face because we selected two edges that are kind of like surrounding that face. Y and flatten. And there we go. So two different ways of getting the same result. Um, and you can do that in different circumstances. So one might be better than the other. And you have two different uh, algorithms here, depending on what you need to do. So the best part about this is just that it keeps all of the other faces exactly as they were. You're not bending anything, whatever. It, it just it just works and it's simple, but, but quite useful. Uh, the next thing that you can do is to basically turn triangular bevel corners into, uh, into quad corners. So the reason that this is important is because there's some things that you just can't do with triangular corners, for example, on bevel uh, or unfuse. So if we were to select these faces, we'd get an error if we tried to unfuse them. Uh, let's go here, like so. Let's try to unfuse and we'll get an error. An error. And that's because uh, it's trying to unfuse the entire edge loops for these faces here. Um, but I can't really do that because, you know, for this face, the edge loop continues and goes downwards like that. But for this one, it continues and goes that direction. And so when they're all kind of crisscrossing, it doesn't know which way to go. And this corner would just turn into garbage. Um, so it just kind of errors out. So what we need to do in order to actually get this to work is to turn this into a quad corner. And normally that would be pretty difficult because, I mean, how would you turn these into quads? Good luck. I mean, they, all, they are already quads, but they're not all flowing in the same direction. Um, so that would be quite a tedious process to do so. Uh, but their quad corner tool, you can just select this entire corner. I'll select the middle and then hit Control plus to grow the selection. Hit Y and then quad corner. And there we go. It's already made into a quad corner. So you can see that they're all flowing in the same direction. We now have an end gone over here where all of these uh, faces meet, but that's okay. It works, works for this. Um, and you can manually choose which face you want this to go in or which uh, direction you want this to face in. So now the corner is flowing around this direction. Um, now let's make it flow from here. Let's make it uh, take a corner and go downwards. And then we can unfuse in that direction. So let's select this corner, hit Y, quad corner. And so now it's flowing around and down. So if we were to unfuse this, you can now reasonably guess that it's going to unfuse this section right there. So Y and unfuse, and there we go. And of course, we can always fuse that up again, change the segments, change the tension, do whatever we want to do, uh, and it's going to work. And since this is a quad corner, we can now do the same thing down here. Uh, we can either you know, unfuse, or we can just straight up unbevel it, turn that bank back into a sharp corner, and we're good to go. Um, let's see, we got some questions over here. <laughs> nice. Uh, this one is Mesh Machine? Yes, this one is indeed Mesh Machine. 
Jessic asks, I am overall impressed with this add-on. I'm following the author's YouTube channel. The thing that I don't understand is how does, it, does this workflow help with irregular shapes? Let's say you're making a robo crab or robo beetle. How to achieve such curved shapes in this flow method? Um, maybe I'm missing the point. Really, it would be useful in the modeling with bevels shown in the gun tutorial you mentioned. Uh, yeah, so basically this is entirely about modeling with bevels. Uh, if you're not using bevels, then it's not particularly useful. Maybe the flatten would be helpful in, in some cases, um, but this is only to do with if you're working with bevels regularly. And um, yeah, if you're not using bevels, then it's not going to be a huge deal. But if you're doing like hard surface thing, uh, if you're using hard ops, uh, or if you just like using bevels, then then this is a, a good add-on. Um, yeah, it's just different workflows. You could you know use use subdivision surface if you want, um, but this wouldn't really be too helpful in that type of workflow, just because it's not really related. But yeah, the best part about this is just the fact that it uh, can take it back to exactly what it was before, before beveling. Let's see, lastly, or yeah, I think this is the last one. It can turn corners, so if you've, I guess we can demo it on this one, if we just unfuse these guys, Y and unfuse, like so. Let's unfuse this as well. Because let's say we, instead of uh, this path going along this way, let's say we actually wanted it to wrap around the top. So we could simply unfuse these guys and then take this corner here. We can see it's a quad right over here. And in order to kind of go around the top, this needs to be up here, which again would probably be a pretty tedious process involving merging, splitting, whatever. Um, but here you can just hit Y and turn corner and there we go change the width like so and then if we were to select this y and then fuse we can do so like that y and fuse and y and fuse there we go so now i've just changed the direction of the flow so those are, I think I've gone through all of them. Let me double check to make sure. Fuse, change width, flatten, unf unfuse, refuse. I guess we didn't really talk about refuse too much, but it's essentially just changing bevels after the fact. Where uh, we select these, hit Y, refuse, and we can change the segments. Oh, I think we did go over this. Um, but there's also a, a bridge function as well, which just changes the method of doing so. Uh, which is helpful specifically if you're like connecting two objects, uh, then it gives like a better interpolation between the two. But yeah, such it is for Mesh Machine. All in all, not very complicated in terms of um, using each individual tool, but when all working together it's just it's so useful uh, and it's stuff that I didn't really know that I needed until I used it and now I'm not sure how I'd be modeling without it so next up if there aren't any questions on mesh machine let's go and talk about decal machine because it's a little bit more involved it might take a little bit more time so let's see here we go Decal machine. Easily add non-destructive details to complex surfaces. How does it do that? Basically it takes these textured stickers that almost look like real geometry. I say almost because it's not exactly, but it's very, very close. Um, and you can really easily position those wherever you want on the mesh. You can project those to match the surface normals and material edit the decals after creation, create custom decals on the fly, or externally batch create them, so you can make your own decals, uh, non-destructively slash through surfaces. So last week we looked at the hard ops slash where you can take two objects and like cut through. 
uh, one object with another object, but with decal machine you can do that non-destructively, which is just super cool. Uh, you can bake the bevel modifier down to non-destructive custom mesh normals, which is definitely a mouthful. And quite honestly, it seems like that would almost be better in a in a mesh machine type tool. As it, I'm not sure if that exactly has to do with decals specifically, but it it's in the tool and it's a super cool addition to it. Uh, you can also fix surfaces with difficult normals. Also seems more of a mesh ma mesh machine style thing, but it's in decal machine. Uh, and you can also also export these decals for use in Unity and Unreal. Now the exporting thing, uh, I got a little bit hung up on. I was I was testing it a bit yesterday and today, uh, and there's some quirks, but I think I ironed them out. So I'll definitely try to go through that as much as I can. So let's just start a new project here and take a look at decal machine. So I guess I should have something a little bit more interesting to look at. Uh, let's, let's add Suzanne. Why not? Um, I think this is definitely a pretty complex surface. If you were to try to you know, add holes in this mesh or add in complex details, really your only option would traditionally be booleans and get those nasty geometries um, where sometimes the shading might be weird and there's just you don't have a ton of options for for how to add details to this beyond just like regular normal maps um, but here we do so let's add some decals to this guy or i guess girl oh you're right sorry i forgot to uh transition back all right, here we go. So we're just working on Suzanne. I gave her a subdivision surface modifier, uh, and we're going to add some decals. So to add a decal in Decal Machine, you just hit D, and first, without anything selected, hit D, and you get these inserts. This one's blank because I added my own. Um, I don't think I gave it enough time to render a preview, so that's okay. But these are all the ones that you would get with Decal Machine, and let's just pick some circular holes, something that would be pretty difficult to try to add to this kind of surface regularly. Um, and you can just hit control and position this wherever you want on the mesh. You'll see it's some, at some points it kind of like cuts through, but uh, let's say we want to give her some holes right about here. And one tool that I've been using a lot that comes with decal machine that's made specifically for rotating these decals, I've actually used with just regular objects and it's super helpful. So if you're in decal machine or if you just have it installed, uh, you can hit control shift alt and then scroll up and down on your mouse wheel and it'll rotate things 45 degrees, which is unbelievably useful. So you can even do that, you can even do that with regular objects and it'll go around its local Z axis. Um, so I think even if we you know, rotate this something weird, we can still rotate it in even increments around its local axis you know, even though we're still in global space. So this is just super useful and uh, I use it all the time. So let's add some holes here. You can see that this is a kind of a complex surface. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, question. Uh, decal machine has a D shortcut and I use the grease pencil more than decal. So I'd like to know how to change the decal machine shortcut to control D. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can do that in the user preferences because by default, yeah, it takes over the D key and then it gives grease pencil tools with control D. Uh, but if you go to file, user preferences, no, oh, where'd you go? There we go. Decal machine. Uh, it has a settings right here under key maps. And then you can just remap this where it says decal machine. You can change that to control D and then grease pencil pi, change that to D um, and that'll do exactly that. So once you have this positioned roughly where you want it to be, then you can select your target object like so. Just hit D and decal project. And that's going to project that right to the surface like so. And sometimes it uh, still cuts through a little bit. So you can change the projection or the decal height, which usually I'll just change the uh, mid level of the displace modifier that adds 
and that kind of brings it up a little bit. Um, but now you can see that that added it directly to the surface. And so it just kind of looks like it's stuck there like a sticker. But what's pretty cool is if we go into rendered view, it looks really good. Like you can hardly tell that this is not geometry. Um, there's some instances where it's, maybe I brought it up a little bit too much. But yeah, if you were to go and render this out, like it looks pretty solid, unless you're zoomed in really far. This is just way easier than trying to add that with geometry. That would be an absolute nightmare. Um, so this is really cool. And the reason it looks surprisingly good is because it's not using uh, regular normal maps. It's using, it's using, um, let me find the GIF of it over here. It's using parallax mapping, which is not something that I think is, is default in Blender, but it's using this crazy node tree Actually, I can show it to you in the materials here. So if we go into the shader node for this, tab into it. Actually, no, it's not the shader. It's the parallax over here. So this is what's plugged into the vector. You'll see if we unplug this, then nothing changes here. But if we were to go into render view, this is just a regular normal map. But as soon as we plug in the parallax mapping, then we get that depth effect like so, uh, and this is what controls it. So this is a really, really uh, large rabbit hole of math that I'm not going to pretend to understand at the moment. I'm sure I could dig into it a little bit, but I, I don't know, it's beyond me. But when you plug that in, then it gives an actual depth effect. So in the documentation, he provides a GIF of the difference and that'll probably be a little bit easier to see than uh, waiting for cycles to like resample every time. But you can just see this flip between regular, kind of flat, and then parallax map, where you can actually see like down into the details a bit, where it's not just you know a flat map. It actually looks like it has substantial depth. So that's what kind of gives it the good uh, like faked mesh effect. And it, yeah, for most things. <coughs> unless you're like extremely up close, this works perfectly fine. Um, and this is, you know, mostly for use in, in a game pipeline, but even for renders and cycles, this, this is great. Um, and again, is just a perfect uh, combination. If you combine this with hard offs, if you combine this with a mesh machine, then yeah, this is just another level of details and another way of doing it. So, Parallax mapping is pretty sweet. So let's add some more decals over here and see what else we can do. Hit D, bring in some other ones. Um, so these are all things that like subtract from the surface. Let me bring this over here. Decal project. Change that mid-level a bit. And since we have hard ops enabled, then we can also mirror these things super easily just by hitting Q, mirror, and then choosing which way you want to mirror it. That's pretty useful. Um, let's add some of these inserts, which are kind of both going in and out, I guess. Uh, they're a little bit more complicated, but they look pretty cool. And I'm just kind of like randomly sticking these on the surface, but Ideally, you'd, you'd give a little bit more thought to where you're placing everything. Uh, but you can see that what it's doing is it's kind of like taking the geometry that Suzanne has and then like applying it to this plane, uh, then transferring the normals using the, the uh, data transfer modifier, and then it's using the displace modifier to kind of place it directly on the surface and give you a little bit of uh, adjustment. And they're also parented to the object, so if you move this around, that's totally fine. Uh, JSIC asks, but if this is a Blender special shader, then how would you move it to a game engine? Does that mean it does not export baked simple normal map? Um, sort of. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
So I can get to that at the end if we if we have time. Um, but the export process is interesting because it exports differently for different engines. So I messed around with it a little bit in Unity, and let's see if I have the test here. Yeah. So you can export these to Unity, and there's a way of doing that. Um, but you need to use the special shader that comes with it. So when you export this, it's going to give you a set of like machine shaders uh, that you can see here. And let's see if I go to let's see decals, um, and you can find them in Unity under machine decals. And then you drag in these custom textures, which are like an interesting combination of of things. Um, so you're not going to be using standard shaders. You're going to be using custom shaders here. And similarly in Unreal, uh, but there's a few a few different nuances there, um, especially since in Unity you need to switch to deferred rendering in order to get the parallax mapping and all that stuff. Um, so it is, it is very Blender specific, but one thing that you can also do is you can bake these down to regular normal maps. And that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, at the moment I've been using this to make some sci-fi assets, which I can show you guys at the end if you want, uh, but I've been baking them down uh, to those meshes so that they can be used in anything because I don't want to make something that can only be used in Unity or only used in Unreal. Uh, I want to be able to provide these assets in a way that they can be used for anything. Uh, you can put them up on Sketchfab, whatever you want. And so I don't want to like limit people with that. So I'll just be baking them down to regular normal maps and that's totally possible here. Um, so you don't get the cool parallax mapping, but it, you know, it looks like any other, any other game asset would anyway. So that's fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sweet. So let's continue adding a few of these guys. Um, actually we can, we can do a few more things with this. So we talked about how to easily position these on the mesh. Uh, project decals to match surface normals. Um, edit decals after creation. So that's something that we can we can do. So let's say that we have decal. Let's go along the ear or something. The 3D cursor, and let's add a latch like this. Uh, and since this is just a texture on a mesh, we can do some pretty interesting things. So we don't have to be just stuck with exactly uh, what we have here. So in case we want to make this the latch part of this longer, again, since this is just a mesh, we can easily do that by adding edge loops. Excuse me. Um, you have to turn on correct UVs, and that way, yeah, as you slide this, it won't uh, mess anything up. So you can add in new edge loops like that, and then just take this and then stretch the uh, texture. I guess we'll have to go along the normal like so. So now we have a really long latch. Uh, let's place it here like so. All right, D and decal project. And there we go. So we can edit these afterwards, which is quite nice. Uh, and if you ever get them like shooting through the mesh because of the way it's projected, it might end up on the other side. Uh, if you have the projection depth set too high, you can see that it kind of like shoots all the way through. Um, so you just need to lower that and you'll be set. And if you don't want to see those wires, then uh, you can also just go to none in the D pi menu. And you can see that you know some of these do get a little bit stretched, um, but you can kind of fix them after the fact, or you can uh, re-unwrap them or change them in the UV editor, and kind of like fix the distortion that way if you if you want. But some of them do get a little bit twisted every now and then. Okay, so more things that you can do with this. Let's do a slash. So kind of like in art ops where you can slash through objects, you can bake that effect, I guess, would be a good way to put it, um, by adding in like panel lines. So let's slash through this corner of her head here, let's see, 
maybe not going through anything else. Let's go there. Am I hitting anything? I don't think so. All right, so let's slash this. So we're going to use the uh, sphere to cut like a line around this part of her head. So we select these two, hit D, and slice topology like so. And it's just going to add a panel line right along there using the topology of Suzanne. Let's change mid-level there. And there we go. So now if we look at this in cycles, it looks like there's a slice cut out of her head. There we go. And you can also do something similar, but if it's like a really dense object or whatever, uh, then you can also not use topology uh, if you wanted to just generate new topology instead of using Suzanne's original topology. Uh, and the way you do that, let's just throw in a cube here, is use slice float. And this will just create new geometry that attempts to match it. And again, you might get a little bit of, of weirdness right around these corners. Um, but again, since this is a mesh, you can go in and you know clean this up however you want and like re-unwrap it and change all of those different settings. So sometimes it can be a little a little hit and miss, but so far I've enjoyed using it. But yeah, as you can see here, there's there's actually quite a bit of cleanup that would need to happen uh, around here to make it look good. And since this is new geometry, it's also been uh, shrink wrapped, which pretty helpful, such that it won't go anywhere weird. Always will stick to the surface. OK. So there we go. We've made a panel cut. Uh, you can also do that with different materials. So this was automatically assigned, or maybe I assigned it the initial base material that machine uses. So anytime you have a, a new object here, and you want it to match those decals, you can just hit D, initial base material, and it'll give it uh, that same base. Uh, but you can also change this. So let's say I made a different material, and I wanted to give it a different color. Make it a little bluish, a little lighter, like so. Um, now it doesn't really match these panels. Uh, but what we can do is then select these guys, Select the base, hit D, and then, ooh, maybe you only need to select two. There we go. Match. And now it'll match part of this panel with that material. So match. Uh, and if you wanted to flip these two, then you can hit D and panel flip, and it'll flip which side of this has been ma uh, matched to the mesh. So we can do that for some of these guys. Match. Match. And this won't work for extremely complex materials, but it will work for anything that just has like a regular uh, principled BSDF or, you know, diffuse glossy kind of stuff. So nothing too crazy, but it'll try to match these outsides a bit. Um, that way it looks more natural than just kind of, um, I don't know. It looks less like, a, like an actual sticker and more like it's supposed to be there. Okay, one more. I think let's do one more, and then let's look at some more stuff. Um, oh yeah, you also have different like uh, text inserts or like uh, just paint decals that you can place anywhere. Decal project. All right. Uh, you can also do a material cut which is very similar to a panel cut that we looked at before, but in this case, it'll use a different material and apply it to that area. So if we had give this sphere something new, let's give it a principled BSDF and make it yellow. Let's 
smooth shade it. All right, something like that. Uh, then we can select these two, hit D and material cut. Oh, actually, okay, so I was thinking of something else, but you can also do that. So you can material cut uh, like so, and it'll just cut through this option here. So you can hit L and limit by one of these, seam, there you go, and apply a new material to just this area. So that's pretty helpful if you're, uh, if you want to change the actual material that it is, or you can apply a material decal, which is just like a regular decal, but it applies a uh, new material to the area. So the underlying base mesh is not changed at all, but you just have another decal on top of it. Let's mirror some of these guys. Oops, Q, mirror, that way, there we go. Uh, J6 says, I guess new feature called plug will replace most of the decal machine use cases. Uh, some of them, yeah, so in different ways. So uh, plug, which I don't have a version of the, I don't know whether that'll be in mesh machine or decal machine, I forget exactly. Um, but it's essentially like adding uh, hard ops inserts, but a little bit more natural. Like it fits to the mesh better and it has better transitions between the two. Um, and I, I don't think it'll completely replace this because this is something that you can use in a game pipeline. Um, and this is very low poly. Whereas plugs uh, are not necessarily going to be low poly um, because they're actual mesh. So I don't think they're gonna compete with each other in any way. I think they're just different ways of um, achieving details, but for different use cases. So you can use them in, you might want to use plugs for like really large areas, but then for small details like screws and bolts, you can use uh, decals. Yeah, I think this is enough of that. Like we've looked at most of these details, there's different cut lines that we can use, all that stuff. Um, yeah, for now, let's look at a few of the other features that are a little bit interesting. So one of them that's uh, it's interesting is the W step right here. And what this does is it applies the bevel modifier and makes the, that's kind of a weird way of putting it. Okay, so I guess you'll just see it in action. Um, but if I add a bevel modifier here, turn the width down, Give that a base material so we can see it. Um, you can see that this now has a lot of chamfers everywhere. And this is kind of why I was thinking it fits more with the mesh machine because it, it deals with chamfers and bevels. Um, but if you have a bevel modifier here and you increase the segments and it's really nice and smooth, you can shade it smooth, uh, whatever you want, or maybe S sharpen the load degree, something like that. Okay, so you have this that's beveled and it's very high poly. Uh, it's not something that you'd want to export to a game engine. But what you can do is hit D and W step and this makes it look like very little happened, um, but it actually just removed all of those extra bevels. So if we look at this in wireframe view, this is now much more low poly. And what it's done is it's basically um, taken that mesh that we had, duplicated it, removed all of those in-between bevels that made it a bevel instead of a chamfer, it made all of those into chamfers, and then it's applied the normals of the beveled one to the chamfered one using the uh, data transfer modifier. So if we hide this and unhide it, you can see that you know this is, is in fact just you know a low poly mesh, I'll Alt H to unhide it. Uh, you can see that this is, you know, relatively low poly. But as soon as we turn this on, it's getting the normals of that high poly one. And what's interesting here is that instead of actually changing the... Uh, instead of giving it like a, a normal map, this is actually the geometry normals itself. Um, so this isn't even textured, it's not unwrapped or anything. It's just applied those normals, these normals. And we can kind of look at this. If we go down to normals here, and if we go to vertex per face normal, 
uh, I don't I guess since this isn't applied then we won't see it in edit mode when we change this that's a bummer um, but yeah it changes the direction of these vertex per face normals uh, so that it appears as if it's was uh, beveled so yeah it's kind of uh, it seems like a very niche thing to do but when working with game assets I can definitely see myself using that uh, quite a bit especially just with the whole bevel baking thing it takes a while so this might make it easier so that's a kind of a cool one uh, another one is a surface fix so let's say that we're working on Suzanne here and we've added our decals but we want to add uh, an actual like boolean inset so Let's say we use hard ops and we want to just throw something in here. Let's see, like this guy. That's not what I wanted to do. Oh, I was thinking of, uh, I see. All right, let's use one of these guys. Okay, so let's say we cut this out. We have to be a little bit more careful here because it doesn't actually project it to the surface like decal machine does. All right, merge, there we go. So you can see how now we have this horrible, horrible shading that's going on. Uh, can you keep on editing this base object or the normals are getting messed up? Um, I'll have to try that in a second, but first I want to show you this because it's it's super cool. So here in edit mode, I guess if we need to apply the boolean modifier, again, something that's fairly destructive. Uh, now we have all of this terrible shading, and we have these booleans here, and they're not inherently bad. Some of these vertices we can probably clean up a bit. Kind of merge these guys together like so um, but overall this is not looking pretty let's remove doubles like that yeah looks pretty bad but we get that nice cut and inset so what decal machine allows us to do is hit D and then go to surface fix and it creates a new object and here we just need to recreate that initial surface to get that better smooth shading back. Um, so I'm actually going to, let's see, take this face here, control plus, throw that selection. Uh, do I need to do that again? I don't think so. Delete faces. There we go. This will probably take at least a little bit of time just to get done, but it's definitely worth it. So if we take all of these extra vertices that we don't want, Alt-M, merge at last. So we only have one vertex there. Take all of these guys, Alt-M, merge at last. Select these, I'll merge it over here. Alt-M, merge at last. Okay, so now we have this triangle, and I'm gonna try to roughly recreate the original quad geometry that we had. Um, one thing that I kind of dislike about some of these add-ons is that it, it throws you into face snapping mode with rotation turned on. And most of the time when I'm modeling, I really want vertex snapping turned on instead without rotation. Uh, maybe I'll have to do something where it automatically switches to vertex when I'm in edit mode and then face in object mode. That would probably be much faster. Um, but anyway, let's snap those, remove doubles, and now you can see that the shading is back. And what we want to do is apply that to the initial object. So once we do that, we can hit, uh, or we have to go out of edit mode. You can see this is called surface fix Suzanne. Hit D, commit surface fix, and voila, look at that. 
it's applied that shading to these normals. Uh, so you can see that it's basically just taken all of these ugly lines here and fixed them. So this one's still a little bit of a, a problem just because of, I guess, the N-Gon shading itself kind of sucks. Some vertices that are super close. Uh, maybe if this was attached to that and we fixed it again. But overall, um, this is just a, a quick, fairly quick way to actually fix some of these Boolean issues that you might get. If you're working with Booleans and you get that like weird shading, then you can fix it like so. Uh, can you keep on editing the base object? Oh yeah, so let's go back to the other example and see if I can keep editing the base. Um, maybe not as it is a, a step, in, in which case it's uh, likely that you're committing your changes. But let's give it a try. So let's say bevel that a bunch, smooth shading, D, W step. Yeah, so when you go into edit mode, it's initially hidden. Um, and that's kind of the indicator of what's going on. Kind of like hard ops hides things once you step it up. Um, but yeah, if you now edit this, Yeah, it, I mean, it still sort of works, but yeah, it would definitely get a little bit messed up. So I guess this is a, a very last section of the pipeline kind of thing to do, not something to do uh, as you're going. But since this is just a modifier, you can always turn it off, add another bevel modifier, W step again, do it that way, uh, that might work. But yeah, it looks like that's something that you'll want to do at the very end. Maybe duplicate your mesh and then do it just so that you don't lose any changes um, and just kind of be careful about it that way. Jake says this could replace my shrink wrap modifier technique for fixing shading under surface details. Yeah, I think that's, that's mostly what it's doing under the hood as well. Shrink wrap, uh, data transfer normals, and call it a day. Maybe you have to reapply after edit. Um, I don't think so because it's still taking that other object and projecting the normals that way. So it's still kind of storing those uh, initial initial things. And since it doesn't go back, um, so once I once I beveled this and it did the W step, you'll notice that it doesn't go back to what it was originally because originally it's just a regular icosphere. Um, but once I W step and unhide it, you'll see that these aren't the straight edges that we had before. Um, and I don't think we can, I mean, you might be able to unchamfer, I don't think you can unchamfer all of these because it's n-gons and whatnot. I'd be very impressed if this works. Yeah, um, you can't do unchamfer with n-gons. So you could go around and individually or every single one of these, or maybe you could select all of them this way. Unchamfer, yeah. Um, so you'd have to do all of these one at a time to get back to the original one and then do it again, but that's a lot of work. So really I just duplicate your object, save that on another layer just in case you need to go back and then continue. Um, that way, yeah, you don't wanna lose any changes there. All right. So there's not a ton left to talk about. Let me left, definitely let me know if you have any questions. Um, but we've talked about everything except for exporting decals. So this is kind of the last piece of the puzzle here. So first let's look at exporting to Unity. So if we select everything here, there's a special export menu you hit by going Control, Alt, Shift, E. And you definitely won't be hitting that one by accident, but then you can create Atlas Group so with all of these guys selected, like so, and then once you have an atlas group, you can hit E and initiate decal atlas. And what this is going to do is make an atlas of all of the decals, as the name implies. Um, and you can adjust things here. So let's say, for example, that we only have you know a few of these, and they're not very big. So there's not really any reason it needs to take up this much space. We can shrink that down. 
Uh, it can't go over the original size, just because you know it can't be larger than what it was before, but you can shrink down everything else uh, in comparison if you want. And then once you're ready, just hit Control alt shift e again, repack that atlas. Uh, it gives you options for padding or downsampling if you want. So let's say we want more padding, repack. And it's kind of nice, it gives you some uh, information up here. Control alt shift e accept Atlas solution. And that brings us back to here. And then, so this means that they're all uh, unwrapped and packed into a game-ready Atlas. Not something you need to do if you're just rendering this out in cycles. Um, but that's created a group. You can see that they are included in a group here, DM Atlas decal. Uh, one thing that I learned is don't try to add things to this or subtract from this manually. It's got a lot of under the hood stuff going on that uses this group, so you can't you can't just remove this or add a new one. Uh, it won't it won't work exactly the way you might think. But yeah, once we have that, then we can select the things that we want to export and create an export group. Um, info Atlas. Oh, I guess since we have some info. Then we need to add an info atlas there. Let's just accept that solution. Then I think we're ready. Yep, create export group. Multiple targets. Exactly one non decal needs to be. Okay, so. Ah, uh, that's right. So this is not a decal, so it can't be part of the export group with this guy. Uh, it can be if you're using a simple export group right here. But for this example, let's just hide that. That's okay, we'll use the normal workflow, Control alt shift e create export group, like so. And the way you know that things are ready to be exported is it removes all of the fancy materials uh, that you can't see in the viewport. There's no ambient occlusion anymore. Uh, things look very flat in, in the viewport. Um, that's how you know it's ready to go. Then Control alt shift e one more time. And now you can export to different things. So here you get the options for everything that you can export it to. Decal Bakedown, Sketchfab, Substance Painter, Unity, um, with a Back9 shader, Back9 shader, I don't know, uh, Machine shader, Unpacked, or Unreal Engine 4. Now I will export to Unity using the Machine shader. And you get different options here. I'll call this Suzanne Machine. All right. Sounds good. And once that's done, you can go to the export menu again and click export. Ah, save your scene first. This has a lot of good reminders in it. All right, now that I've saved the scene, we're good to go. And that'll automatically open up everything that you need here. In a folder, it gives you your shaders, it gives you your FBX, uh, and it'll also give you some of your textures here. So now if we open up Unity, Suzanne looks like she came out of the hospital. Yeah, not her best day, to be honest. It's a little rough. All right, I will delete these objects first so we have a blank slate. Uh, one thing that's good to know about working with this in a game engine is that all of the decals in your scene are going to be using the same material and same, uh, the same uh, texture atlas. Right, so if you have multiple game assets that are going to be used in the same scene, they need to share the same atlas uh, and same like export group and all that stuff. Um, otherwise, you know, it's not going to work. You have to use the same material for all of them. So once you've exported it, you can drag the, these things into the project. Uh, since I already have the shaders, I'm not going to load those. I'll just upload the Suzanne machine, um, and I'll grab these textures here, add them in as well. Add her right here. And so you see that it's not grab the camera as well. Didn't need that. Okay. 
So here we have Suzanne and, <clears throat> excuse me, all the decals are applied. Now, the reason that they're, they're doing this, uh, instead of baking this down into an original texture, is, is definitely interesting. I'd, I'd recommend reading the polycount forums on it if you're interested. Um, search for the, the method, methods that they used in Star Citizen and uh, I forgot what the other one was, but it's called the deferred decal technique, and uh, it's really quite interesting. But essentially, what it is is instead of unwrapping the entire thing and making textures for it, you can just assign this a base material, and then all of the decals stick those on with with lots of uh, little textures. But since they're all using one large map, uh, it apparently just saves more um, memory than using a bunch of individually wrapped textures. So I don't know. I haven't dug too far into it or like the reasons why, but definitely it works and it's pretty cool. So first I'm going to give her this base material like so. And one thing to set up before you do this is you have to go to edit project settings layer. And under color space, you gotta switch this from gamma to linear. So I'll show you the difference here. <clears throat> yeah, there's a bit of difference, but that'll just make sure that the decals look correct. Uh, and then you also have to go to edit, project settings, and graphics. Man, my throat is super dry. and switch the rendering here. You can see there's different tiers. Um, for the viewport, you just need to change tier three, but if you're exporting to other programs, then you'll need to change the other tiers as well. And for each different uh, environment that you're exporting to. But since we're just using tier three, uh, let's click use defaults for everything else. And then you gotta switch the rendering path from forward to deferred. And that's important because the parallax mapping won't work with forward rendering. It'll only work with deferred rendering where it saves kind of the lighting until after those, those textures are taken into account. Um, otherwise, it'll just end up as black patches. So once you switch that in the graphics settings, then we can go back to the material and apply the decals material. So I created a, a new material and just called it decals, like so or maybe they were part of it, and then I um, right-clicked and, what is it? Oh, once it's like packed, ah, here we go. So you find the materials in here, decals, right-click, extract from prefab, there we go. And that'll make it so you can actually edit it because otherwise you can't actually texture stuff there. So I'll drag the decal material over there and I already set this to machine stuff, but normally it'll be just standard. And then you switch to the machine shader, decals, uh, plane, and then you drag in these textures here. Let's see which ones are, probably just should have started from a new project, but oh well. Um, so you drag in the textures, and one interesting thing is that the normal map right here, is not something that you need to change to an actual normal map. So normally when you're using this with a normal shader, or a standard shader, I should say, uh, you would switch this to a normal map. But if you were to do so, you'd get some pretty weird effects uh, and just incorrect shading. So since this is a custom shader, you just leave it as default and it takes care of it under the hood. Uh, it's also helpful if you turn off compression, it'll just make it look a little bit better. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, yeah, then it'll work. So you can also do that for the panel decals, like so, drag in that material, drag in those textures. And the uh, machine material has special settings for you know the parallax height. So we can zoom in here and see exactly how much parallax effect that we want to be added to it, like so. And you can really see it on this detail here if we're looking at it this if we're looking at it from this side um, it really looks like there's a little bit of an 
of an edge going into the mesh there. Then we look at it from this side. Then again, we start to see it right in there. So that's a pretty cool effect. Um, you can you know turn that up, turn it down as you wish, change the ambient occlusion, all that stuff. So that's how to use it in Unity. And it's fairly simple. Uh, if you're working in Unreal, I don't believe you can get the parallax effect um, as far as I know. I could be wrong though, so don't hold me to it. But uh, let's see. Oh, questions. Also, can I, I can see a use for Element 3D in After Effects? Yes. So as I'll show, I'll, I'll show this example now, um, may as well. But for everything else that doesn't necessarily support that kind of like parallax mapping, or maybe you want to export it to something else, then what you can do is you can export just like a generic normal map from it. Uh, let's go Control Shift E and uh, reset the export group. Or I guess we could switch export here as well. Um, if you switch to unpacked, then it'll just give you a whole bunch of textures that you can use in basically any program. Um, if you hit Sketchfab, then it'll do something similar. Um, but what I was going to do is the decal bake down. And so what's, what this is going to do is apply these textures, both the info decals, the material color. Um, it'll take the normal maps from here and apply them just to the Suzanne model. So instead of exporting the decals as additional mesh to Unity, then I can take this and just export the Suzanne mesh and give that into Unity. Um, because one thing that you'll notice here in Unity itself is that I didn't actually unwrap this at all. Like this isn't unwrapped, it didn't need to be. Um, it just has this regular material with the other stuff on it. Uh, no need for UVs, no need for seams, no need for all of that stuff. So that's really handy. But if you're working in a regular pipeline that doesn't support these decals, then you can do the bake down. So let's open up a UV image editor here and quickly unwrap this. Smart UV project, which is almost never the right choice, but for the sake of time, it'll work. Let's give a bit of margin, not that much. All right, so pretend this is beautifully unwrapped. Then we can now take these guys, Control Shift E, and this is where I got a little bit stuck before, so hang with me if, it, if I don't get it on the first try. But if you switch to Decal Bake Down, it'll give you all of the maps that you can possibly bake to. Uh, resolution, distance, bias for baking the normals and whatnot, uh, transfer sharp edges, which is helpful for making sure that the shading is correct on hard surface stuff. This doesn't have any sharp edges, so it's fine. Uh, substance naming, so it'll automatically apply the normals to, it'll automatically apply the map to the correct part of the normals in Substance Painter as soon as you kind of drag them in. So that's helpful. Um, and yeah, so once you do that, bake down. And yeah, that didn't work. So before, what I had to do was reset the export group, like so, create a new one. Oh, it was because I, I moved the stuff before. That's what it was. Okay, so when I moved the stuff into Unity, I kind of messed up with the, uh, I messed up the file. So I'm just going to delete all of these. And it'll just have to make a new one. All right, let's try this again. Really hope this works. Did you save a new blend file since packing this atlas? Yeah, maybe. OK, yeah, so I, I messed up by dragging that stuff into Unity. Bummer. Okay, let me just reset everything. Um, honestly, I think it would be Mesh Machine. 
I think that would be the most useful at this time. Uh, just because it works with just regular bevels. Um, probably be mesh machine number one, hard ops number two, decal machine number three, box cutter number four. If I had to order them, but they're all good. Uh, William says it went offline. Okay, it looks like something stuttered. Let me know if it's back, but it says everything's healthy, so I'll continue going forward. Uh, let me know if you guys missed anything. Maybe the electricity guys from the other day came back. No, they didn't come back, but I they literally uh, reset the power. It wasn't even like pulling the plug. Like They didn't actually like leave it off for more than a second. But they reset the power as soon as I stopped the other stream. It was like within minutes. It was, it was pretty tense. I was kind of worried about that. But apparently they really needed to give me a new, uh, new meter. Okay. Um, so yeah, I did actually answer your question. <clears throat> In terms of like which ones I think I would buy in order. Probably number one, Mesh Machine. Uh, number two would be hard ops, three decal machine, and then four box cutter. Mostly in order of which ones I'd find the most practical for my personal workflow, but I don't work the same as everybody else. Everybody works a little bit differently, so it all, all depends. So basically I was having trouble with the export here and kind of struggling through it as I was going um, because I exported to Unity first and then moved some of the files around that it needed to work. So that was, that was my fault. Um, but let me make a new atlas, accept the atlas solution. Good lord. Let's reset all the atlases. Bring everything back to normal. Man, now I'm just getting lots of errors. All right, let me just try this again with a new file because I did something to mess it up and I'm not sure what it is. All right, let's just add a couple decals here. But yeah, this is pretty much the the last few like details of the stream. I didn't have anything really beyond this. So if you have any other questions, let me know. Or if you want to see something in particular, that's totally fine. But uh, yeah, this whole export thing was kind of throwing me off earlier as well. Jake says, hard ops will need some fixing for 2.8. 2.8 uses Q for the user. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everything will need fixing for 2.8. Um, it's just, it's a different beast. And since things aren't in the tool shelf anymore, like we need to find like another place to actually put some of these things. So I guess hard ops in particular, most of it's in the 3D view, so that's helpful. Um, but a lot of add-ons will have to be pretty, pretty redone. Okay, so let's try this again. Control Alt Shift E, create Atlas group, initiate decal atlas, accept, initiate info atlas, Except uh, I gotta unpack this guy or uh, unwrap. Really smart UV project, give it a little bit of margin. And I can see that in 3D view if I go to hard ops. Let's see. Maybe I can't do that in edit mode. Oh well. UV preview looks fine to me. All right, create export group. Now I need to save the file. Actually, it's better to do that before creating the export group I read in the documentation. Hmm, now it's still saying. Oh, it's because I named it after making the atlas. 
That's what it was. So I saved the file after setting up the atlas, and so as you save the atlas, it saves the file with it. That's what I was doing wrong. Okay, let me try this again. Two point eight uses less shortcuts to make it easier for developers of add-ons, so it shouldn't be a big problem. No, I don't think so. It should be should be fine. I'm glad this is fun to play with, otherwise redoing this a few times would be kind of annoying, but still pretty fun. Uh, so let me know in the chat, like, which of these do you think you guys would use? Um, do you think you would use any of them, or what would you use them for? Any projects that you're working on? Let me know. I'm always curious to see if, whether this would be actually useful or whether it's just like interesting to watch. I don't know. All right, so I projected some details. Now I need to save the file before doing the atlas. That's what I learned. OK, save as, save it as another test file. All right, then, then create the atlas group, then do the decal atlas, <clears throat> accept the atlas solution. There we go, so far so good. Select those guys, create export group. There we go. Uh, did I unwrap this? I don't remember. Let's go U, smart UV project. Give a little bit of a margin, like so. UV preview looks fine. Control shift e Okay, so this time we're going to do the decal bake down. And what it's going to do is take these and kind of just like stamp them onto the surface. Control alt shift e I don't need to export the FBX. All of this should be fine. And all right, bake down. And that'll take a minute or so because it has to bake all those textures. <clears throat> See, I use hard ops and box cutter all the time. I don't think mesh machine or decal machine, scroll down, would be all that much use. Silent Heart says you definitely give both a whirl. Jake says on second thought, he'd want mesh machine first, decal machine second, hard ops third. I just don't see myself doing a whole lot of that highly intricate mechanical detail. Yeah, that's true. It definitely depends on like what your actually working on. Wilco says, for now, I won't use any of the add-ons. In the future, I think I'd start with hard ops. Um, and this is something that Jerry said in the last stream, and I 100% agree, is that uh, these add-ons, and these are included with what he said about his add-ons. Um, I definitely add them all together in this group. They're going to make you faster modelers, but they're not going to make you better modelers. Um, so if you have trouble making uh, detailed objects and you know let's I don't think you guys are but let's say for example if somebody's like a bad modeler and they just make a mess this is going to help you make a mess much faster and make a much larger mess um, and that's certainly the case with me when I was starting out. Um, so it's not going to help you, you know, magically create awesome stuff if you don't know the fundamentals. But if you are a good modeler, then they can help you make good models faster. Um, and in so doing, help you create better models because you have more time to spend on them. But yeah, don't, don't think that you need to get these in order to be better or like create cool stuff um, if you can't create cool stuff already on your own first. So definitely learn the fundamentals first. And then as you're kind of running into these walls, that's when you know, like, okay, that's when I should get it. Um, but if you're not running into those walls, don't worry about it. It's not, uh, it's just kind of a fun, fun thing to explore. Matthew asks, can one use decals as actual mesh components? 
Um, can you clarify what you mean by that? Uh, Christina says, I'm working on a sci-fi project. Decal comes in handy for panels and stuff like that. I used Hard Ops and Box Cutter for the basic shapes and the Greebler by Mark Kingsworth. Ah, oh, yeah, that's a cool one. That's on the Blender Market. That's pretty sweet. Uh, I will complete the project with the decal machine. Nice. Looking forward to seeing it. And Martin said he made a sweet, fancy box. Let's see if I can view it. Oh, yeah, very cool. Look at that. And this is using decal machine. Yeah, you can see right there. Very cool. Nice. That's pretty awesome. I like the colors on that, too. That looks sweet. Um, but yeah, okay, so once that's done, it'll take these out. And so we have the atlas textures, which were the original packed atlas. But since we're just using the square by itself, we don't need that. Um, so I'm going to Shift D, duplicate the square, move it over to another layer. So we're not looking at the decals or anything to do with them. Um, let's see, can we remove this from... Yeah, I'll just reset the groups. Like so. Oh, that was interesting. Okay, so this is just a regular object now. And it's already been unwrapped, so let's apply those textures. All right, so if we drag them in here, so we go to the baked textures folder that it created, drag in that normal map. Um, we can drag in the ambient occlusion. Some of these are really only useful in other programs, but here might be good. We can try the height, why not? and uh, alpha to like isolate the decals if we need to. All right, and here we can start mixing stuff together. All right, so this is the ambient occlusion. So I'll shift A, color, mix RGB. Uh, and I realize that I'm rendering while I'm streaming. Hopefully that doesn't cause any problems. Uh, but let's multiply these together. Plug them in like so, and switch this to non-colored data because it's uh, not a albedo texture, just black and white. Normal map, so vector and normal map. Plug that in, you can see it just works like a regular normal map, non-colored data. Cube height, we can also Use a bump map if we want. Kind of add that to the normal map. I don't think we need to because I think it'll just do the uh, same thing. But I don't think there's any extra details in this. Now it doesn't look like it. But if for any reason you're wondering how to combine a normal map and a bump map, this is how. Non color data, plug that into the height. Maybe it'll just make it extra strong. Uh, but yeah, there we go. And if you wanted to isolate those details, then you can use this alpha map. Yeah, that's how you export it. And you can plug these in in Substance Painter as well. And one thing that's cool, uh, how much time do we have? Let's see. We've got for about an hour and a half, so I'll probably wrap this up pretty soon. But let me know if there's anything else. Oh, does anybody know the theme? Oh, the theme uh, that I'm using? Yes, file user preferences. Uh, I'm using Modern Minimalist, which is my own theme, but it's actually in Blender. Uh, so it's bundled by default, and you can find it in your presets. Question, would using Decal Machine be kind of the same functionality as adding decals in Substance Painter? Yeah, pretty much uh, if you're doing this bake down technique. So, yeah, essentially, it just comes with the ambient occlusion and all that stuff. Uh, let's try this in Substance Painter, just for fun, because uh, I do want to show you something. Though it's been a while since I've done it, so I don't know if it'll work the first time, but let's go. 
export FBX. Sure, this works. Selected objects. All right. Let's load up Substance Painter. Create a new project. Do to do. OpenGL, everything else is good. Import mesh normal maps and baked maps. Uh, where did I? Oh, I saved them. Where did I save it? Oh, here they are. So these are all already named with the substance naming convention, so hopefully they'll assign them correctly. Ah, looks like it didn't. Let's go to texture set settings, plug in the normal map, like so. Ambient occlusion. All right. Um, yeah, one thing that I wanted to show is if we go to the layers, if you ever want to add things on top of it. So say we already had a normal map. Uh, for example, let's say that these corners were not beveled. And you needed to combine the result of the decal normal map with the uh, regular cube, like. Um, bevel shader normal map or baked baked bevels normal map. Um, that's something that I was was working on. Uh, so what you can do is add a new layer as a fill layer and then add this. So let's just get rid of this guy. Ah, can't see it. There we go. So let's say we already have the normal map taken up by something else. Then what we can do is add a fill layer like so and make that the normal map. Ah. Use only normal, like so. There we go. So this would be then added onto whatever normal map we already have set. And then what's interesting is that we can now add an anchor point, I believe, as this layer. So let's call this decal normal and add anchor point so this is something that you can do to the decal normals and what it'll do is if you're using a smart material let's go down smart materials probably should have done this on a more complex object but that's okay oh don't crash okay we probably have too much going at once uh, but let's pick an interesting one. Go machinery. Okay, so this is placed above everything else, and so you can't really, you know, see it. You, I guess you could put this on top, but overall, it's not really. Uh, the details here aren't really respecting this. I guess I need to bake the world space normal. Uncheck ID, let's pick normal, AO, sure. Okay, make those really quick. But essentially this is a way to get the, that dirt like into the crevices of the decals. Because um, otherwise it doesn't really show up in the right spots. Yeah, so it, it added them here. But if we were not using that normal map, did it bake it with the world space? No, it did not do that. So where is that coming from? Oh, it's probably coming from the ambient occlusion. There we go. OK, so let's say that our ambient occlusion, our normal map is already taken up. Can't do it. The dirt is not in the right spot. 
and we have those decal normal maps, but just not working. So what we can do is go to the dirt and go into the mask here, mask editor. And since we've added a uh, anchor point to the decal normal, let's go to the properties, go to uh, micro normal, anchor points, decal normal. Reference channel normal. And I believe that should add those extra details. That's really disappointing if that doesn't work. I swear this works. Ambient occlusion not found. Hmm. Sorry about that. I've definitely used this before because I know that's what uh, anchor points are mostly useful for. If anybody's done this before, definitely let me know. This should be in the normal channel. Hmm. Yep, it got me. It stumped me. I'll have to look this up later. Um, I was hoping to show you guys that because it was pretty cool. But I know for a fact that it did have to do with the anchor points here. Micro normal. No reference found. All right, I'm stumped on that one. But to make anchor work, I think you need to have normal still working and applied. I don't know much about this program, but I thought you turned off uh, AO on baking. Oh yeah, I did turn off AO. Um, that's why I just needed to add that in later. Have normal still working and applied. Uh, you probably lost it when you removed the normals at one step. There was no curvature on the object. Uh, I did bake those afterwards. I mean, I can add in the ambient occlusion again, but that kind of defeats the purpose of, of showing what I was hoping to show. But that's okay. Yeah, I probably lost it somewhere along the way. I'll have to look in that, into that, and uh, obviously since I'll be doing this kind of thing in my next course, then it'll uh, be going over it anyway, and I better figure it out before then. But for the most part, this was talking about decal machine and mesh machine and how to use those together. So hopefully we covered it, got a little rough at the end, but I think it was quite fun and entertaining. Uh, mostly I think Mesh Machine is just absolutely killer. Um, it's so much fun to be able to go from just like a completely, uh, not unusable, but like something that you couldn't ever get back from to take something that is very destructive and make it non-destructive is always helpful. So. Um, maybe there's more things like that out there that I don't know that I need, that I, that I do. Hopefully we can discover them soon, but Mesh Machine is one of them. And then Decal Machine is just kind of fun to play with and definitely useful for like quickly adding small details to stuff. So thanks again for watching. Uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, I believe next week is Jonathan Williamson talking about Rotoboflow 2.0. And if you didn't know about that, that was released today. So definitely check out the video for that on our YouTube channel. Um, it's a couple years in the making and it's a huge, huge upgrade from the original. Um, and he'll be talking about that and demoing it and answering all your questions about that next week. So I'll see any last minute stuff. I don't believe so. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching and take care.